Hey there, quarantines. Back again to talk more a little bit about the Civil War and um, some of the long-term effects it had, uh, especially by way of Reconstruction. So, um, before we get into talking about Reconstruction, I think that's the official title of this video, um, let's talk first about the war itself. And, you know, I don't think these are, these are review videos in order to prepare for this year's AP test. And while military history is important and interesting, um, I don't see it being a huge part of our exam this year. So um, we're not going to harp too much on like individual days and names by way of military history. But, you know, there were some general things to note about uh, the, how the Civil War was fought. It's going to be important to our discussion on Reconstruction. So, you know, the overarching plan for the North, which, by the way, the North is an industrial economy, and they have a lot more people than the South does. Um, so their general plan was the Anaconda plan. They figured they would just blockade the South and just, like, slowly let the South suffocate, since the South doesn't have any way to manufacture its own goods. And it was, you know, an export-based economy, specifically exporting cotton, um... The North figured the Anaconda Plan would be a pretty, like, swift end to the Southern Rebellion. Um, however, um, you know, the Southern strategy had some, some strong um, military leadership. In addition, um, the South figured that Europe would support them because many European, many areas of Europe um, depended on Southern cotton. Um, and so the South figured that specifically Britain would um, would support them in the war effort, and they came close to doing so. You know, in class we talked about the Trent Affair, which was a British ship um, in hostile waters that was taken over by um, a Union ship, and some British officers were taken, um, taken captive. And so, you know, Lincoln kind of freaked out because um, we were pushing Great Britain and the South together, you know, as a Union, as, as a as a union action. And so Lincoln um, made a strategic move, notably, um, you know, his his plan, I want you to remember, Lincoln was not necessarily an abolitionist. He was fighting to keep the union together, and he was making war strategies to win the war, to force the South back into the union. And, um, and so he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed slaves Interestingly, it freed all slaves in states that were currently in rebellion. So the border states that still had slavery um, did not have to free any of their slaves. And so it, the Emancipation Proclamation only applied to states that were currently in rebellion who weren't listening to what the federal government was saying anyway. And so, um, and so Lincoln issued this Emancipation Proclamation, but importantly what it did is it defined the purpose of the war to end slavery, which means that Britain, in a country that slavery has been banned, it's unsavory, people think it's a nasty institution, they're not in favor of it, Great Britain is not going to come to the support of the South to fight for slavery. Um, and so the Emancipation Proclamation, while it didn't actually free any slaves in that moment, it defined the purpose of the war to be about slavery, which effectively kept the South isolated from any kind of European allies. Um, and it also gave Lincoln an opportunity to talk a lot about how we're fighting a war to uphold America's ideals, like, like equality. And at Gettysburg, the turning point of the war, um, Lincoln made a famous address which talked about how, you know, this is a democratic government where all men are created equal of the people, by the people, for the people. And so therefore, you know, he's just reiterating the purpose of the war is to preserve these ideals, these American ideals that were laid out in our founding documents. Um, and so that's what we're fighting for. And, and Lincoln was making that point over and over again with the Emancipation Proclamation, the Gettysburg Address. It was strategic. Um, and so eventually, you know, you've got you've got this defined purpose of the war, which is Lincoln's Lincoln's strategy to keep the South isolated from European allies. And then you have also the way the North fought the war, which was basically burn everything down in the South. And a famous example of that was Sherman's march to the sea when he marched from Atlanta Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia, and um, split the South in half after we completed the Anaconda Plan with the Battle of Vicksburg. Um, and so we were able to um, to complete the blockade, and then Sherman's march to the sea further divided the South, 
in a way that the South strategically couldn't come back from. But Sherman was notorious in his actions because he just burned everything. Farms, farmland, um, houses, livestock, you know, everything was just basically lit on fire as Sherman marched across the South. And, um, and those, those two things matter, right? The definition of the war, the war strategy being the Emancipation Proclamation, these, these ideals that all men are created equal, you know, um, and also the way the, the Civil War decimated the Southern agricultural-based economy, you know, both of those things are going to matter when we start talking about Reconstruction. So when the war ends, the Union wins the war, you know, Lincoln already has a plan in place for how we're going to reconstruct the Union. He has it as early as 1863, and it's it's colloquially known as the 10% plan. And so Lincoln um, enacts, you know, he he lays out this 10% plan, and it's it's pretty lenient from from a, a radical Republican perspective. But basically, he said um, that most Confederates who would be given full presidential pardons as long as they took an oath of allegiance to the United States of America and accepted the emancipation of slaves. So slavery is over. Lincoln is going to outline that as one of the main points of his 10% plan. And then as far as the state being readmitted to the Union under Lincoln's plan, all that really has to happen is that 10% of the voters in that state need to swear that allegiance, that oath to the United States. That's not a lot. And so, you know, a lot of um, more of the radical Republicans in Congress scoffed at Lincoln's plan. And although in Lincoln's plan in practice, you know, it basically was a proclamation that each state would have to rewrite its constitution to ban the, the institution of slavery. You know, that's all he was really getting at. He was getting at, look, we fought this war. Slavery's over. Everybody is emancipated. Let's move on. We'll, we'll forgive and forget and just get past it. But for more radical Republicans in Congress, they, they, did, they thought that was too lenient. So they, in response to that 10% plan, they passed the Wade Davis bill, which said actually at least 50% of voters in every state has got to swear allegiance to the United States of America. 10% is not enough. We are, we are fighting this war. We're still in the middle of the source. It's 1864 when the Wade Davis bill is passed. And Lincoln actually vetoes it. And so already... Before the war is even over, you can see that there's going to be some tension between the presidential version of what needs to happen to reconstruct the South and the congressional version of what needs to happen to reconstruct the South. And that's basically how reconstruction works. There is the first wave of reconstruction, which is presidential reconstruction, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then there's the second wave of reconstruction, which is congressional reconstruction. And basically, the whole, the whole discussion is... One, how do we readmit Southern states back into the Union? Because understand, the Confederate States of America, collectively the Southern states, are fighting a war against the United States of America, against our Constitution, against our military, against our flag, right? And those, those Southern states, once the war ends, are now conquered territory in, as a result of, of war, right? Like, we now have that territory... What are we going to do to, like, reform those state constitutions that have been decimated because of, you know, their secession, their decision not to be a part of the United States of America anymore and to form their own country? And um, so how do we rewrite those state constitutions and readmit those states back to the Union? You know, these areas of our country were just fighting against each other. How are we going to get them to reunite and, like, work together again. And also, importantly, how are we going to protect the rights of people who used to be enslaved? How are we going to protect the rights of black Americans living in the South that now slavery is over, but they their, their rights as citizens of the United States of America now have to be developed and protected? And so how are we going to do that? You know, And so pr presidential reconstruction and congressional reconstruction squares off on those two main points. How do we readmit states back into the Union? And how do we protect the rights of black Americans? And so, you know, spoiler alert, Lincoln dies. He gets assassinated in Ford's Theater. He's shot um, and, and he dies. And, his, and so his 10% plan and the Wade Davis bill, all that ends up kind of being water on the, under the bridge because, well, Lincoln's dead. It doesn't matter what he vetoed anymore. Um, 
However, that fight that was setting up between presidential reconstruction plans and congressional reconstruction plans persist because Lincoln's vice president is an interesting dude. His name is Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson is actually the only Southerner, the only senator from a Southern state who did not leave the Union. He remained loyal to the United States of America, even though he was a Southerner through and through. He was from Tennessee. Um, he was... He, he was um, become famous in Tennessee by championing the rights of poor white people in Tennessee against the rich elite planting class. So Andrew Johnson really, in his early career, he hated plantation owners because he saw them as opposed to the interests, interests of poor whites in Tennessee. And that's how he became famous. And although he was a Southern Democrat, he stayed loyal to the Union. And um, Republicans chose him as Lincoln's running mate so that Lincoln could appeal more to to the to everybody, to the Democratic Party and to the Democrats that were still remaining in the North, um, albeit few. And so um, so Andrew Johnson becomes Lincoln's vice president. Um, and really, like I read somewhere, in, and I've got right here, that he ends up just being the wrong man for the job because he's a white supremacist. And he was born into, born and raised into a Tennessee society that is based around the institution of slavery. And so President Johnson, whenever he takes up the presidency, he actually has more lenient views than even Lincoln did in his 10% plan. And so Johnson, right away, his reconstruction policy is forgive and forget. And although he officially said, um, you know, if you were a Confederate office holder, you can't become a voting member of American society again. If you were a Confederate office holder or Confederate um, leader in the Confederate military, then you are not allowed to vote or hold office ever again for the United States of America. However, um, he left it open for presidential pardons to be basically whoever he wanted, which was basically a get out of free jail, get out of jail free card for the rich, elite, plantation owning class. That Johnson could just ve could just pardon anybody he wanted to, and he did. He used that pardon, and so basically, the the impact of Johnson's super lenient Reconstruction policy is just eight months after the end of the Civil War. All eleven of the ex Confederate states, all eleven of the Southern states that fought against the United States of America, had been reunited back into the government, and. Um, and so, and it was almost like nothing ever happened. And to the dismay of many congressmen, um, actually a lot of former Confederate leaders were reelected right back into the halls of the United States Congress. They were, they were, they regained their office holders. It's like nothing ever happened. You know, like they seceded from the United States. They organized their own government. They fought against the United States of America. And then eight months later, they were back sitting in the same Senate seats and Congress seats that they had been sitting in before the Civil War ever even happened. And not only that, but they were also, Southern governments began, began passing these black codes, which threatened the rights of black Americans in the South. And so, basically, Republicans in Congress were upset, okay, to say the least. They were unhappy with the way things were going. And so you start to see, you know, this first wave of Reconstruction, these first year of Reconstruction following the Civil War is this presidential Reconstruction, super lenient, super forgiving, it's letting everything go. Um, and then you start to see more radical Republicans in Congress gearing up to fight back against this presidential Reconstruction. You know, Johnson, notably, he vetoed, and he, he, he was a white supremacist. He used white supremacy as, as a reason as, and, and as a way to consolidate power, especially in the southern states. He, he fear-mongered. Um, to like to promote the the uh, his white supremacist stance, so he vetoed civil rights acts, he vetoed Reconstruction acts, um, he vetoed bills, he vetoed twenty nine bills in his Congress, which you know that was a ton, that was like three times the amount that Lincoln vetoed, and so um, so his vetoes it really set him apart from Congress because he was angering congressional Republicans with his constant veto of their attempts to exercise some control over how Southern states were readmitted to the unions and also protect the rights of free black Americans in the South. And Johnson was not allowing that to happen. So radical Republicans in the, in the, in the Congress really started to gear up to fight back against 
Johnson. And so you start to see, going into 1866, you start to see the start of a second wave of Reconstruction. Rather than presidential Reconstruction, it's all this lenient forgiveness, Congressional Reconstruction is going to be a lot more intense. And so you've got... You know, you've got a split between radical Republicans and moderate Republicans. Radical Republicans who want to guarantee active um, protection of black Americans' rights in the South. And moderate Republicans who, like, yeah, they, they, they fought for the Union. They, they were worried about, um, you know, they, they were abolitionists, I guess. They, they didn't want the expansion of slavery into any new territory. But they're really more concerned with the economic well-being of, like, the white middle class. Um, whereas radical Republicans are like, yeah, we need equal rights. We need civil rights. And so um, in, in Congress, radical Republicans gained a lot of power. And those radical Republicans began fighting back against Johnson's. Um, Johnson's vetoes by overriding them. So most notably, they fought to override the civil rights, the veto on the Civil Rights Act of 1866. They established the Freedmen's Bureau to protect um, free blacks in the South by way of allowing them to have education and property and, um, you know, a venue to protect their voting rights. Um, You know, these radical Republicans were, like, pretty radical. Like, they wanted... Um, they wanted the southern governments to basically be controlled by the federal military to stand down and allow free blacks to get an education in schools that were run by the federal government. They wanted free blacks to be given reparations and land that were, were seized from the planting, the plantation owning class in the south, uh, people who were Confederate office holders and Confederate military leaders. Their land should be seized and given to now free blacks. I mean, these, this was the position of radical Republicans in Congress. That's how far they were willing to go to fight for civil rights for black Americans in the South. And so, um, you know, these radical Republicans are overriding vetoes for Johnson's, for Johnson's uh, vetoes of civil rights acts. They're advocating for these causes. And, um, and also they're passing amendments to the constitution, like the 13th amendment that ends slavery. Um, the 14th amendment, which is arguably the most important amendment in the constitution. And and, and the 14th amendment is important because one, it, it defines citizenship, right? It says anybody born in the United States of America is a citizen of the United States, regardless of anything else. And also it talks about Specifically, that the states, that state governments are obligated to protect the federal rights of all citizens that they have living in their states. So it says the term equal protection under the law. And now it's not about reserving power to the states, which is what you see a lot in previous amendments to the Constitution. It's more about putting an obligation on states to protect the rights that have already been given to all American citizens. So they have equal protection under the law. Everybody has, every citizen in the United States has equal access to the federal protections that's given the, given to them in the Constitution. It's a really big deal. It's going to be a really big deal in the 1950s and 1960s, too. And so the this wave of Congressional Reconstruction, you see these radical Republicans fighting for civil rights, fighting for reparations, fighting for protections of black Americans, and also wanting to punish Southern governments for what they did. And so this is the this is the mood of you know the fight for reconstruction going in to the presidential election of 1868. And so Andrew Johnson, you know, he's still fighting back. Like he's still trying to veto things. He's still holding holding his own. He's still trying to fight back against uh, radical Republicans and he does so by using white supremacist rhetoric, rhetoric, like he's warning people against the Africanized society. You know, he's playing on the fears, especially of white Southerners in the South, that, um, you know, that there is something to fear from equal rights or equal protections for black Americans. And in response, the Southerners wave the bloody shirt is what they call it. They remind everybody, we just fought this terrible war um, in order to end slavery and protect free and to protect black Americans in the South. Um, keep in mind these Southern governments caused that whole war. People died. It was expensive. It was this whole five-year ordeal. 
And it was all the fault of the Southern governments that were clinging to the institution of slavery. So radical Republicans are waving that bloody shirt. They're reminding everybody that we had to fight a war over this stuff. And now it's time to step up and protect the rights of those people who used to be enslaved. And so ultimately, Johnson continues to veto things. Congress says, enough of this. And they impeach him. And Johnson's impeachment happens in an election year. And so essentially, in 1868, people are like, yeah, Johnson's done. He doesn't get removed from office. He's impeached, but he stays in office. However, he, he loses the election. Um, Ulysses Grant is elected in 1868, and he becomes, he becomes president um, following Johnson's presidency. Although it's noteworthy that Johnson's presidency was going to end regardless because the Republicans nominated Ulysses Grant. And Johnson, who was considered a Democrat still, um, even though he was Lincoln's vice president, he was still a Democrat. And the Democrats actually nominated somebody else to run um, on the Democratic ticket. So Johnson was going to be done either way because the impeachment was just too messy. Um, and so Ulysses Grant, war hero, is elected to president. He's a Republican, is elected president, president in 1868. And, um, and basically he just kind of like stands down. Congress is the the era of congressional reconstruction is controlling politics at this point. Radical Republicans in Congress are doing the thing. And I mean, they're going so far as to institute martial law in the South. They although Southern governments were technically reelected or readmitted to the Union under Lincoln under, under Johnson's adoption of Lincoln's 10% plan, um in 8 months after the Civil War ended, all of those states got readmitted to the Union, the um, the radical Republicans in Congress passed martial law in the South and actually sent the federal military to those Southern governments and forced them to rewrite the constitutions to include, you know, f protections of Black Americans, the absence of Black codes, um, the, the ab abolition of slavery, protections for voting rights, whatever they wanted. Really, and they didn't, and, and the federal military did not leave that state until they were satisfied that that state had met all of its requirements for reconstruction. So, some states like Tennessee only had the federal military stationed there for about a year. Some states like Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina had the federal military stationed there for 11 years. And the federal government had instituted martial law in those states for 11 years. Uh, for 11 years, those states were held in limbo, not allowed to fully participate in the federal government, um, and being controlled by the United States military to force, force those states to have constitutions that upheld specifically the rights of black Americans. And so, um, and so that martial law continues on, and um, Congress continues to fight for the protection of black Americans. And they saw some success. You know, there was the election of black, uh, of black legislatures in the South. Some, some legislatures in the South had as much as a third of the entire legislature were black Americans. There were two black senators, a handful of black congressmen elected to the United States, the federal Congress. Um, and there was widespread voting rights for African Americans, absolutely. And um, however, that, that success was limited because there was so much political infighting between the president and Congress, because Grant had a ton of vetoes as well. And, and, and Reconstruction was such a political mess, was such a political back and forth political fight that, you know, a lot of those Republican um, people who were in, who were watching the, the Southern governments, they were accepting bribes, they were turning the other way. There was some... Um, some corruption and bureaucratic institutions that are supposed to be upholding the rights of black Americans in the South and guaranteeing that Southern governments were following reconstruction standards. But a lot of that ended up not being as realistic as some radical Republicans in Congress had hoped. So basically this like reconstruction of the South, it goes on and on um, with, with very limited, with very limited success. And a lot of that has to do with corruption in government and a lot of red tape and bureaucracy that gave too much opportunities for corruption in government, even amongst Republicans who were in the South trying to do the right thing and enforce Reconstruction um, standards. So basically, what ends up happening is that this continues on, this kind of Reconstruction limbo, political limbo, continues on into 1876, the election of 1876, where... Um, 
there was no winner. You know, there there was a Democrat and a Republican running, and the election was so close that neither of them would concede. It was between um, the Democrat, whose name was Samuel Tilden, and the Republican, whose name was Rutherford Hayes, and they were running against each other, and the, the election was so close that neither one of them were willing to concede. And so basically, this was going to be a political fight. It was going to go into the House of Representatives. It was going to be this uh, continuation of these political arguments that were dominating Reconstruction until eventually the leaders of the two parties decide to work out an informal deal. And the Democrats basically said, look, we will give you the presidency. Rutherford Hayes, the Republican, can be president if you withdraw the federal troops from the remaining Southern gover governments, which were Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. And so that's what they agreed to. And Reconstruction ends with the Compromise of 1877, which basically, that was it. You know, all of this political fighting, presidential Reconstruction versus Congressional Reconstruction, and even within Congress, the radical Republicans fighting against moderate Republicans, you know, the ongoing vetoes, the, the fight to force these Southern governments to follow Reconstruction standards. All of those fights that had ensued in the decade following the Civil War basically just ended with this backroom deal, the Compromise of 1877, which said, listen, the, the resolve for the Northerners wasn't strong enough, and so they just gave up. And they said, okay, fine, we'll take the presidency and we'll withdraw our troops. And so troops were withdrew, withdrew in Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, and that's the end of Reconstruction. Um, but before we move on, let's talk about what life was really like on the ground for, for black Americans who were emancipated from slavery and now, you know, trying to figure out their lives as full on citizens of the United States. You know, there was, um, like I mentioned, some political success initially for African Americans in state legislatures and in the federal government. Black Americans were ready to vote. They were ready to be involved in the political process. Um, and, and so what you ultimately saw actually was how Southern governments were so staunchly opposed to granting rights to people who used to be enslaved to black Americans in the South that you saw terrorist organizations like the KKK pop up. This is when lynching becomes a popular way to, to keep African Americans from exercising their rights to vote or speak out or, um, engage in the political process in any way, shape, or form, um, and even in some cases to engage in economic systems. And terrorist organizations like the KKK and the White League um, saw lynching as a way to maintain the white supremacy of the slave system that is now illegal under the 13th Amendment. And so um, not only or there was there a lot of voter disenfranchisement with the rise of black codes and eventually Jim Crow laws that that made it to where black Americans did not have access to political institutions or any kind of voting rights at all, um, especially after federal troops left those states after 1877. Any kind of political achievement or um, political freedom or in, or voter enfranchisement that was granted or earned by free blacks in the South were, was gone, right? That was, those were st slowly stripped away by Southern governments determined to maintain white supremacy. And um, not only was voter disenfranchisement um, the reality for black Americans in the South, but also, and, and, and living under terrorist organizations like the KKK and the White League, and having to deal with the constant threat of violence, especially in the form of lynching. But also, the sharecropping system made it to where Black Americans in the South were bound to economic poverty as well. And the lack of economic opportunity for Black Americans, the resistance of the federal of the Southern governments to industrialize in any way, shape, or form, their, the Southern continued reliance on agricultural systems rather than industrial systems, the South's economy never developed because it was the Southern governments were too busy trying to make sure Black Americans didn't get any rights. And so instead of letting go of white supremacy and like developing an economy that would be effective in the long run, Southern governments 
continue to cling to white supremacy at the expense of any kind of economic prosperity. And so what you see now in the South is what I think is the most significant lasting impact of Reconstruction is still some of the most impoverished areas of our country is Louisiana, um, Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, across these areas of rural South where they're just, the economy just never developed. Because rather than working to develop the economy, Southern governments were too focused on maintaining white supremacy. And um, that's a huge lasting impact of Reconstruction in the South. Um, so Reconstruction, I think we can pretty much accept as a historical truth, was very limited in success, right? We fought the Civil War, um, but I think a question that we need to ask ourselves is, um, you know, how much changed for Black Americans in the South following Civil War? Although there were legal aspects to rights, uh, it's going to take another century before any of those legal rights are actually realized for African Americans. And so, um... Reconstruction success, very limited, um, but also an incredibly important part of history to learn. Because in order to understand, you know, what society looks like right now, we have to understand that oppression for Black Americans in the South did not end with the Civil War. It did not end with the 13th Amendment. In fact, some historians posit that life for African Americans got worse following the, the ban of slavery with the 13th Amendment. And that is an extremely important um, fact to understand when you look at society today and uh, draw connections in history to understand how Reconstruction um, is still impacting us right now in the form of poverty in the South, in the form of ongoing fights for equality and freedom in the Black community, and also um, in the form of how white supremacy um, continues to be pervasive in our society today. Important stuff. Let's keep thinking about it, talking about it, learning about it. It's the most important thing we can do. All right, quarantines. Take care of yourselves.